get started. So we um, are just finishing up a few concepts on chip analysis, and then we'll move on to other um, or to other types of chip analysis for object recognition, and then we'll talk about shading. Come. So. Um, I wanted to talk very briefly in other applications. So we saw a, a couple of applications already uh, in our previous lectures on how to use uh, ship analysis for object recognition. You can do that or you can use uh, ship analysis for a variety of other computer vision problems, as we'll see later. Um, one of them it would be behavioral analysis. And a very simple problem within that is uh, gate recognition. So let me talk about this uh, very briefly. And you have the, a paper on this topic in uh, Canvas, as always. So we're going to uh, use um, a, uh, or we're going to take a video sequence, rather, right, that has a person in it that is uh, performing some actions, just walking, running, jumping, um, what have you, some gait. And we have this in a video sequence. So this person maybe, I don't know, is running, right? And there is in that uh, set of images that write the frames of that video sequence, there is some background. that we want to learn with one of the models that we have already defined in mid-level vision, right? And then if we learn the background, then we can do background subtraction and, sub and extract the foreground, which is the person, okay? So obviously this is under the assumption that we know that that video sequence shows the action performed by a human, right? Or some other animal, um, if we know what that animal is. Okay. So what we want to do is now um, extract this foreground, right? Um, for each of the frames. So. Um, remember that you can learn this background. So for example, in the paper you have online, you have for each X, Y uh, position, you create uh, an image of the background, which you can get by taking the input image uh, at that point, right? X, Y, that location of the coordinate uh, X and Y of that image at time T. So T will go from uh, zero or one uh, to say n, um, and then um, actually I'm using capital N, capital N, and then um, you have to learn p uh, such that you are um, op minimizing, right? So you want to minimize um, the difference between these two. And here I'm going to take the medium, uh, or excuse me, the median uh, over uh, the t. And as always, you know, you need to use a norm. Uh, you can square it. You think you can take the absolute value, as always. And now p here is the background that we want to learn, of course. As we have done before uh, for the pixel x, y, right? Um, now, once this model has been learned, then um, we want to use that to subtract, or we will subtract that from each of the frames of the video sequence that we had, and that's going to give us the foreground. It's basically the silhouette of the person moving, right? And now we want to describe this uh, shape of that contour of the person to be able to uh, do some type of recognition. So to do that, first thing that we're going to do is compute the shape centroid, 
as we have been doing. And for example, uh, we can model this, or we can compute this as xc is 1 over n, the sum over all i from 1 to capital N of my xi's, right? And yc is n inverse, the sum of every i, right? That is um, the xi and yi's, the uh, coordinates of the contour that we have extracted with our background subtraction method. And then capital N here would be the number of um, points in the contour of the object, right? So um, say the boundary points. So now um, we can uh, define, so let um, zi's or zk's, because I've already used i, so let me use zk instead. So we can define now our zk values, right, that we have defined before, which define the shape uh, in the complex domain. So for example, x. Um, uh, okay, let me do this. Um, Z K1 through Z K N transpose, um, where each of these Z K I is equal to my X I plus J times uh, Y I. I'm using J for the uh, square root of negative one because I don't want to make, I don't want you to be confused with the ith uh, sub-index here, right? The uh, little i here. Um, and with that, we can define our uk vector, which is uk1 through uk n with now where um, uki is equal to zki minus z var k, and of course zk bar is 1 over n, uh, the sum of all my uh, zki's, right? Yep. All right, so that's what we have done before to define a shape. So now step three, uh, we need to use some sort of distance to measure the difference between the shapes that we have extracted, right? So we can use, for example, the Procrustes distance. So So the Procrustes distance, which we can define or is defined as df of two vectors, two of these vectors, say u1 and u2 vector, it's equal to 1 minus u1, the complex conjugate of uh, the transpose of the complex conjugate of u1, u2 uh, squared divided by u1, u2, right? their norms. Okay. And then finally, given a set of samples, we uh, can compute, we already have the, how, we already have the mean, right? The uh, mean of u but we can also compute uh, the covariance matrix of u. So sigma u, the covariance matrix, is equal to the sum uh, from one through n of ui, u, the complex times the complex conjugate of transpose ui uh, star and ui star ui, right? 
and this is um, the model that determines the variations uh, from the mean shape, right? So now we know the mean shape, we, we have the mean shape, we have the variances from the mean shape, and we have the uh, precursor distance, which is a measure to determine how, uh, how close or similar things are. Okay. All right, so um, the way you would work with this is you start with um, a set of videos, right? So I'm gonna take a set of videos for each category of, um, say, uh, gates, right? That I want to recognize. Right, or they want to learn to recognize, okay? So for example, I can ask 100 people uh, to walk, and I film them as they walk, right? And these are the 100 videos are my set of simple videos of people walking, right? Or I can go to the internet and find videos of people walking, and I extract these videos, and then maybe I can, you know, if it's internet from movies and other videos, I can probably get easily a uh, few uh, hundred thousand of them, right? Maybe even over a million of them. And then all these videos are my simple videos of people walking, right? Now what I do is I learn the background for each video independently, obviously, the background is specific to each video. Then I do background subtraction. With this, I get the contour of the shape of the person. Once I have this, I compute the centroid of that contour, right? And then I describe the shape of the object with the complex um, model that we have introduced in class, right? Where the X is a real part and Y the imaginary part. And with that, now I can uh, subtract the mean. So I center all the shapes at the origin, right? And then I can compute the covariance matrix. Obviously, u hat, right? If I want to get u hat, which is the mean, I can get that by taking the eigenvector associated, associated to the smallest eigenvalue of u hat, right? So I can get u hat now. Um, as the eigenvector associated to the smallest eigenvalue, right? And now I do this for these uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions of samples of people walking, right? And that to me is my model of what people walking look like, right? That eigenvector tells me the mean and the other eigenvectors how I can deform that mean, right? To represent the shape of someone walking, right? Now I go back to the internet and I extract videos of people running, right? And I extract say another million image, uh, videos of people running and I follow the same procedure and I get a different mean, a different uh, set of eigenvectors of possible deformations of the shape of what the shape looks like when people run. And I do that for jumping. And every time I do that, I obtain a different model, right? Of what it means uh, according to the shape, right? W how the shape deforms as people walk versus run versus jump versus a squat versus whatever other gait that I'm interested in, right? Make sense? Now, this will create, so this, um, okay, so let's say other eigenvectors determine uh, the possible deformations, right? Of the shape. And now, so this uh, defines 
the models, or let's say the shape models of uh, the gates we are interested in, right? So now I have learned, say that I'm interested in 10 different gates or 100 different gates, right? So now I've created 10 models, 100 models, one for each. And now I'm given a new video that I've never seen before. It's not in my data set that I have used to create these models, but the new video that I have never seen before that I know shows a person with a specific gate and I know that that gate is one of the 100 I have learned, I just don't know which one, right? And then to determine which of this uh, it is, I can just use the precristus distance here, right? So I can compute, so, um, um, okay, let's see, just given a new, um, a new observation, say UK, right? Then I can use the, I can use the Fulper Christus distance, the F UK you had, right? To determine whether the shape UK corresponds to the, um, to the uh, model defined by this you had, right? Now, um, if I want to take into consideration the deformations of the, of the shape, then I can do a variety of things, but let's talk, let's define two, right, of all the things that we have seen. So one of them could be, I can take that shape, right, and define the space tangent to the hypersphere of U hat at the point U hat, right? U hat is a mean, which is a point in a complex hypersphere, remember? Uh, which uh, has the mean norm normalized vectors. And then I can compute the space tangent to that, right? And allow the formations in the tangent space about the eigenvectors of sigma U, right? And those deformations about sigma U are actually defining um, the, um, the possible deformations of my shape, right? You see that? And then that gives me a weighting, remember? So when I use the distance, now the precristus distance, I have that matrix sigma U, right? That weights the relevance of how each deformation uh, is, uh, or what is allowable to deform in my shape, right? Um, the other thing that we can do is to uh, try to define the distribution of my samples on that hypersphere, okay? So what you would do is for each of these um, samples, these UK samples that you have here for one gate, say for walking, you're going to have all these points, right, all these UKs, mapped on that complex hypersphere. And now you want to learn that distribution on the hypersphere, right? So for example, if we were in RP, we could compute the Gaussian distribution that approximates all my simple uh, vectors, right? But I'm not in RP, I'm in the surface of a hypersphere, right? So that means that I need to use um, a sp what's called spherical distributions, right? And uh, to do that, I'll briefly talk about this very, very briefly. Um, the most common, common distribution that people use is a complex Bingman. And here, um, let's start with our, as always, our pre-shape vector. Uh, let's call it Z as always, which is ZH over the norm of ZH, 
right, which remember is H, our Hermitian matrix times U uh, over the norm of HU. And this is in the surface of a complex hypersphere of K minus two dimensions, right? Okay, so we define the complex Bigman distribution uh, let's denote it as complex B sub K two A uh, as a distribution um, that has the following PDF, probability density function, Fz equals Ca inverse times the exponential function of Z complex conjugate of the transpose Az, um, where obviously Z is uh, in the uh, sphere, the complex sphere of K minus two. A here is hence a K minus one by K minus one matrix, right? It's a Hermitian matrix, obviously, which means that the transpose of the complex conjugate of A is equal to A, right? And CA, this term here, right? This is called, anyone knows what this is called? Anyone remembers? You all know. <laughs> Anyone remembers what this is called? No? I think you all know and you're afraid to say. This is called the normalizing constant. And the reason for its existence is because if I integrate that PDF function, that probability density function, right, the volume under the curve, by definition, for a PDF has to be equal to one, right? And that's what the normalizing constant does. It always guarantees that when I integrate that function, that volume is equal to one. So the reason uh, people use this distribution to define shapes is actually pretty cool um, because the Bigman distribution, the complex Bigman distribution rather, on the surface of a complex hypersphere um, has a nice property to be rotation invariant. So if I have f of a z vector and I now rotate that shape, the shape defined by z, remember that's the same as multiplying e by i theta, right? And this would be equal to c inverse a times the exponential function of e negative i theta, z, a, actually the transpose of the complex conjugate, a, z, e, i theta, right? Yep. And obviously, if I rotate this inverse and thus, this to cancel out, right? You see that? Right? I rotate this way and then back. It's like not rotating. So I can write this as C inverse of A, the exponential function of Z transpose of the complex conjugate A, Z, right? And what is this equal to? This is nothing else than F of z, right? There you go. So we've just uh, proven formally, mathematically, that the shape fz and any of its rotated versions are exactly the same point in my space, right? Um, according to that distribution, so that's what makes it uh, really appealing. So 
you can estimate the um, Bigman distribution by computing uh, the matrix A, right? So that's what you need to do. And so let's see how we can approximate that. So this normalizing constant, so the normalizing constant of the Bigman is given as two times pi to the power of k minus one, the sum of aj exponential of lambda j, where aj inverse is equal to the product of every i different than j, lambda j minus lambda i, and lambda 1 is smaller or equal than lambda 2, is smaller or equal than dot dot dot, the smaller or equal than k minus 1, which is obviously 0, or the eigenvalues of A, okay? Okay, so you can estimate A using, as always, a, our eigenvalue decomposition, um, and that may or may not work in practice. So theoretically, this is a, this is very nice. I could just leave it there. But in practice, if you implement this in your computer, what's going to happen is that these final eigenvalues here from, say, lambda r to k minus 1, uh, they are only the last one should be 0, but the other ones may be very close to 0. And this is because the shape variation about that dimension of the eigenvector, right, is very small. It's super tiny, right? Um, and what that happens is that either you have infinite precision in your computer, right, maybe with 256 bits you can do it, but if you don't have high precision in your computer, then that enters into numerical problems when estimating the uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right? So remember, remember this always, an eigenvalue decomposition system, it's a still an optimization problem, right? There is no closed form solution to finding the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. There is an iterative system that has to be applied, Jacobi method, the QR, there are many methods that you can learn in our optimization courses on how to uh, obtain that if you want to learn more without taking these courses, I highly, highly, highly recommend you buy a book called Matrix Computation uh, that has all these algorithms in there. I mean, it's like the Bible for this, and it should be in all of your shelves, right? I mean, this is a must-have book. Uh, and I believe it's in the syllabus if you're interested in it. And if not, let me know. Uh, so the problem is that you may not be able to compute these uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and you have to be careful. So you have to check whether that's doable or not when you use that method. Okay? Many times it is possible, sometimes it's not. So you have to just be careful. Now, um, it um, it can actually be shown that the main axis of the Bigman distribution is the same as that defining the Perchristus estimator, right? And that should not be surprising because the Bigman distribution, the main axis defines the mean, and the Perchristus main axis is the Perchristus mean, right? So that just means to, that just comes to say that the Perchristus mean is uh, given directly from that Bingman distribution. 
Um, now, if you cannot estimate the Bigman distribution, uh, what, which is relatively, a it's a distribution that's relatively closely, uh, has close resemblance to the normal distribution in RP, uh, what you can use, it's a very simple, another very, very, very simple distribution, which is called the von Mises Fisher distribution. And that's a much, much more simplified distribution. Um, I forget if it's 1s or 2s. Um, I think, I don't know. My notes say 1, but I think it's 2. Anyways, Fisher distribution plus check. Um, and again, this is just to simplify our computations. Um, one may actually think of the von Mises distribution, which is usually just called VMF. So small v, capital M, capital F. Um, the VMF distribution. Um, uh, as um, you can think about the VMF as a circular Gaussian, right? Um, just simple circle, right? Or hypersphere, if you will, in more dimensions. Okay. So um, if maybe let's do this. Um, so if you have a hypersphere. I'm going to draw S1 because I don't know how to draw anything <laughs> of higher dimensions than that. Um, then the von Mises Fisher distribution will look something like this. It would have a variance which is the same on both sides, right? So it's symmetric. And then this will go all around, right, the sphere. Like that, right? Correct? So in the same way that a normal distribution has a peak and then an exponential decrease, and then that tail goes on forever to positive infinity and negative infinity, that's the same thing. That goes all around the space. What happens is that our space now it's closed, right? And therefore we see it actually go all the way around. And this is obviously a much more simplified distribution because that distribution is given by simply by the mean, right? Mu, let's call it the mean mu. That mean tells me where that peak is, right? And then that variance or uh, a density that is called in the von Mises Fisher, uh, say kappa, right? And um, the PDF of the von Mises Fisher is given as, let's call it F small v to make a distinction from the Pigman X given mu and kappa, which is the, um, the normalizing constant of the von Mises Fisher times an exponential function, which is nothing else than X times the mean vector, right? So mu transpose times the scalar of the concentration kappa. Okay. Now here, um, kappa is larger or equal than zero. And remember that the norm of mu has to be one because we are in the unit hypersphere. And CV of X is going to be actually of kappa, right? Uh, is equal to kappa to the power of P divided by two minus one over two pi to the power of two, uh, P over two times I P over two minus one K kappa. And here this U, this I U or I P denotes what's called, do not write this down. I mean, write it down, but don't pay much attention to it. This is called the Bessel function, okay? Now, if you're a physicist, I know some of you have taken physics, 
you will know what a Bessel function is, right? Yes. Uh, but if you haven't taken physics, you probably haven't seen a Bessel function. Uh, but that's okay. And this in particular, it's the Bessel function of the first kind. Okay? All right. The modified Bessel function of the first kind. Um, and if you're more interested, this is actually the best, this be modified Bessel function of the first kind is proportional to the contour integral of the exponential function defined by this, but this PDF F sub V that we've defined here. Okay. Now, because of that, um, there is no closed form solution to finding these parameters for the von Mises Fischer, the mu and the kappa because of that uh, modified Bessel function of the first kind. That's a killer for us. Um, so there are estimates, there are optimization algorithms that, that have been defined out there that allow you to estimate the parameters mu and kappa, right? And then you just have to look for them. And again, as was the case with the Bigman, the Bigman had a different problem. The Bigman had the problem that maybe the eigenvalue approximation is not gonna be good enough, right, because of the precision that you need to compute the eigenvalues. Um, here, the problem is that this optimization method not, may not converge to the correct solution, right? So when you use Bigman or von Mises Fischer, you have to check that your result actually makes sense. And that's easy to check, right? You just get the result and see if it fits the, tr the samples that you are given, right? I mean, it's as simple as that. All right, any questions about this? So these are um, two possible methods to do that recognition of gates. Yes, question. Uh, so with the gate, are you essentially just taking one sample out of the entire sequence, your entire video sequence, and then comparing that one shape to the mean shapes that you had before? So there are many ways to do that, and we'll see this later in the course when we talk about behavioral analysis. But here is a preview of things that you could do, right? Um, you're correct. You could do that one frame at a time. And then what you would do is for each frame, you recognize one of the gates. And then you could do a voting, uh, or you can define a voting mechanism approach where every frame, frame votes for a particular category of gate. And then at the end of the video, the gate that has the most votes is the one that you're going to determine that defines walking or running or what have you. So that's number one. Number two, what you could do is you could define the shape not in 2D because these are 2D shapes, but in 3D. And how do you do that? You take the contour of the first frame, then the contour of the second frame, and you connect them in 3D space. And then you take the contour of the third frame and you connect that, right? And you create this tube kind of shape, right, as it deforms, and you define this three-dimensional shape using the same methods that we have presented here, but now the shape is in 3D. That's the only difference, right? Um, that works better, right, obviously. Uh, and then um, we'll see other methods that we haven't, we don't have the, the tools now to define, but there are other mechanisms that we can use uh, also with nonlinear least squares and um, uh, the gradient methods that we have already introduced for deep networks that can be used to do that. Okay. All of the things that you described for gate is all under the assumption that the videos you have, the subject is just moving around the frame, the frame is Correct. In the background. That's your, under, that's your assumption, yes. Okay. Yes. And also in that, um, particular framework that we've defined here, I didn't say, but you have an, another intrinsic assumption, which is that the motion of that human is, um, is at the specific angles from the camera and that those angles don't change, right? So they could be side views, they could be frontal views, but you have to have representative views of all the views that you're going to later use to test the system with, right? You just cannot train on side views and then hope that you're gonna be able to recognize frontal views, 
of that motion because you're in 2D in the video sequence, right? Even if I could construct this 3D shape, this is 2D plus time, right? So one other thing that you can do is to go to 4D, right? So how you do that? You take the structure for motion algorithms, for example, or other multi-view geometry algorithms that we introduced in 5460 and we extended uh, here in this course, right? In low level and mid-level vision. And then you reconstruct the shape in 3D from a video sequence, okay? And now once I have this 3D shape, then I go back and I'll talk more about this in a second. I go back and reconstruct the 3D shape in each of the frames. And now we're gonna construct a 4D shape, which is the 3D shape of a space, X, Y, and Z, plus time. And now I have a 4D tube, right? And now I'm gonna use that, but to me, for my modeling, doesn't matter whether it's 2D, 3D, 4D, 5D, right? Just one more D. And now I'm going to find this using these methods, and now I can be robust to this uh, 3D post variations, okay? Now remember, we have a tool that allows us to do that, which are the rotation invariant kernels. Remember rotation invariant kernels? And the, the big advantage of rotation invariant kernels, especially in high dimensions, right? Because 2D, uh, you can solve it in percursus analysis. 3D may be solved in percursus analysis, but it's trickier. But beyond 3D, there's just no easy solution, right, within percursus. Uh, but with rotation invariant kernels, you can always find the final kernel. Um, I only gave you the uh, basics here, but you have the paper in Canvas. You can always find a kernel that applies to uh, NED, right? And then you can convert that shape into rotation invariant in 3D space or 4D space, in our case here. Okay, any other questions? All right, um, so one final uh, comment, and I'm only going to comment this because we'll talk um, much more about deep networks and deep learning later on in the course in a few weeks. Um, but another thing that we can do, as I was mentioning, is to first recover the 3D shape from each frame of the video, right? Or if I only have an image, to recover the 3D shape from that single image. Now, if I have a video sequence, remember that I can always reconstruct the 3D shape using structure from motion or any other multi-view geometry method, right? But what happens if I don't have that information? How am I going to solve that problem? So I'm going to call this 3D shape from a single to the image. Okay. So to date, we've only seen how to recover 3D shape from multiple 2D images, right? Two or more. Now I want to recover 3D shape just from one single 2D image. Now, there's an intrinsic problem obviously, that we're going to face, um, which is, by definition, this problem is unsolvable, right? You all agree, right? If I'm given an Im a 2D image, there's absolutely no way I can recover its 3D shape because, as Shannon told us, right? I mean, this is basic Shannon theory, information is like any other measure, or when we measure information rather, it's like doing any other measure in, in the physical world, right? If I have a pound of sugar, it doesn't matter what I do to that sugar, I cannot transform it into two pounds. It just makes no sense, impossible, right? The only way I can make one pound, two pounds is by adding a pound of sugar. <laughs> There's no other transformation that's gonna make a pound of sugar two pounds. If I have 
a, I don't know, a, a, a piece of paper that is um, maybe a feet long, a foot long, right? It doesn't matter what I do to it, how much I stretch it or transform it, I cannot make it two feet. It's just not possible, right? And with information, that's the same thing. If I have X amount of information, it doesn't matter what I do to it, I cannot get two X. It's impossible. X amount of information means X amount of information. And I say this because we are going to briefly talk about the variety of methods people use in computer vision to do very cool stuff. For example, later on, I will allude to some uh, algorithms that are called super resolution algorithms. And that is, you're giving me an image, and I give, and I give you the same image in higher resolution. Right? Now, we need to understand this is physically impossible. Right? I mean, you can watch the CSI type of shows on TV where they have a video or a picture of that car running away and the license plate is two pixels that cannot be, that there's just too few pixels to, to show the number of the license plate. Or the pixels of the license plate are completely blurred, right? And you just cannot make it out. Um, and then they have this amazing software in this uh, TV shows that they pass this video through or that image and it gives them the actual license plate number. Well, I have news for you. It's not that we don't have that technology, it's that that technology will never exist because it's physically impossible. If I have X amount of information, that's all I have. I cannot make two X, right? So, the only thing I can do is to add information. What did I say? I said if I have a pound of sugar, the only way to get two pounds of sugar is by adding sugar. Right? So how am I going to add information to my 2D image, right? The 2D is 2D, but can I add information to this? Now when I'm given a 2D image, I'm going to give a 2D image of something I've never seen before, right? So imagine that I want to do this for, I don't know, faces, okay? Human faces or cars, it doesn't matter. Whatever, I pick an object, okay? I'll go with faces. So I'm given an image of a face of a person I've never met in my life, I've never seen before, right? Now, can I, as a human, make a guess of what the 3D shape of that person is, of that face is? Yeah, sort of, right? I don't know how accurate I'm going to be, but I can make a guess. Why can I make that guess? Because in my life, I have seen tons of faces in the three-dimensional world and in 2D images. And I have learned the mapping between 3D and 2D given some camera model, right? So if a camera model, you know how to go from 3D to 2D. If you have observed lots of 3D faces. Now the, this, this one thing, is the extra kilo of sugar that we need. Right? This is information that we can now add into our system. And that's what we're going to do. Now, adding that uh, amount of information is not perfect because it's not the information, the exact information we need for that particular person because that particular person, we've never seen that particular person before. If we had, we already knew what the 3D shape of that person were, right? So we haven't. So, um, all we can do is to create a model of that uh, functional mapping. So let's think about this uh, for a second. So if I'm in 3D space, right? So imagine that I have, I don't know, a face here. I'm gonna do my best here. I'm not a very good. All right, so I have a face here, okay? And let's say this face is in 3D space, right? So I have my axis here, right? So this would be, say, X, Y, and Z, right? And I have a three-dimensional face. Now, if I take a picture from here, maybe using uh, orthographic or weak perspective camera or pro projective camera, right? I'm going to get um, a picture like this, right? Okay? 
Make sense? Now, um, this is, remember, this is a mapping that I know how to define because I can use a camera model. Right? And a camera model is nothing else than some function f, right? So all I need to do now is to find a way to estimate that inverse function, right? This inverse mapping. All right. <clears throat> so let's see how we can do that. Um, so um, let's start by defining maybe um, our matrix, capital WI, which is going to have my UI1 and VI1. And what these are going to be, they're going to be the U and V values, right, for each of the landmarks of that face, right, the shape of that face. So I'm going to define the landmarks UIVI of the object, right, right? or of the shape, even better, of the shape of the object. And now I'm going to have the first landmark, the second landmark, whoops, VI2, and so on, up to, say, the nth landmark. Okay? And therefore, this is a matrix in the real domain of uh, 2 by n dimensions. Now we know that each of these landmarks, these UI landmarks, UI, VI, excuse me, landmarks that we have extracted here, correspond to some three-dimensional landmark here, right? That is given by XI, YI, ZI, correct? So in the same way, I can define a matrix, call it SI for shape of the ith point, which is now XI1, yi1, zi1, all the way to uh, xin, yin, zin. And this is a 3 by n matrix in the real domain. And of course, we know that we have a camera model, right? Our camera model, let me call that camera model M. Right, as we have done before, our projection matrix. So um, we have uh, WI, it's nothing else than M times SI, right? This is what we have done 100 times. Um, so for example, I can use the weak perspective camera model, which is given by m is equal to lambda 0, 0, 0, oops, lambda 0, right, for some uh, projection parameter lambda. And now our goal is to um, define the zi, okay, to define, let's say that, the xi, yi, and zi, right, of, the, of each of the ith landmark, right? Maybe I can use a hat to represent that this is my estimate. And I want the xi's and yi's to be normalized, right, with respect to the translation and the scale, right? So I know how to do that for shape analysis, right? 
I subtract and divide by the variance. That's as simple as that. Um, so let's do that. And then I need to find the z components. Now, the x and y is easy, right? Because um, x and y correspond to this, in weak perspective projection, correspond to the same as the u and v, right? I mean, they are directly given by the weak perspective equation. So that's easy. Um, so, but how about z? So how about this one? So let's do the z i j is going to be x i j minus x c bar. This is the mean, right? And then maybe divided by the variances. Okay. Oops, this should be y. Uh, and y i j it's equal to y uh, i j minus y uh, i bar. This should be an i, not a c. Sorry. Um, divided by uh, the variance of x i plus the variance of y i. I mean, I guess technically it would be best if we divide this by two because I have added these two terms. But this is just a scalar, so I don't really care about this if you don't want to include it. And, and now um, the zij hat obviously is going to be given in that normalized framework, right? So you're going to have the uh, zij bar, um, z bar and the zij, and here again the variance of xi plus yi divided by 2. Maybe. Okay. And now our goal is to find, so the only reason, remember, I repeated myself, but the only reason I'm subtracting the mean and dividing by the variance is such that all the shapes are normalized by uh, translation and scale, right? And now I want to find the zi uh, that's equal to some function f of my xi bar uh, hat, rather, and yi hat, right? Okay, and now the question is, how are we going to determine the value of f or the function f? Okay. Now there are many ways to do that. Um, I'm not going to cover this in detail in this class because I do cover this in detail in another class. It's called machine learning that you may be interested in. <laughs> And as always, you have it in the YouTube video, all the lectures on this. Uh, this is called a regression problem. And I'm going to walk you through the very basics of how this works. OK? All right, so here's how this would work. First, number one, you collect a number of samples. OK? So if we're doing this for faces, you have to have a face in 3D, the shape of the, the 3D shape of a face, right? And it's corresponding to the images, right? Two things can happen. If you already have the 3D shape because you have a sensor that can extract 3D shape from an object, right? Uh, then, well, you're in luck because if you already have the 3D shape, you can use a camera model to generate as many images to the images as you want, right? So that's easy. But that's rarely the case. It's rare the case that you have the 3D information. 
Now, maybe the exception these days would be for self-driving cars. For self-driving cars, because most companies use LADAR, uh, you do actually have the 3D information of the objects of, in your environment, right? And that allows you to generate 2D shapes of the objects that the car sees, which may be very useful to develop computer vision algorithms for self-driving cars. But for other types of objects, you usually only have a video, an image or a video sequence of that object, right? So what do you do? Well, given a number of video sequences, you can reconstruct that object in 3D space, right? Correct? And now you have both 3D and a number of images, that means the frames of these video sequences, that can be used to match that 3D shape to the corresponding 2D images. So again, we use multi-view geometry on a video sequence to recover 3D, and now we have 3D and images that are 2D. Okay. Now, X and Y are the 2D coordinates of the landmark points, right? Okay. If we use say orthographic projection, we know that X and Y are actually the U and V points in the image. Right? Now, given those, which are given from our 2D images, right, we want to recover Z, which is given in our 3D model that we already have, right, from the samples that we have extracted from videos, right? And now we need to design a method that, given an input X, outputs an output Y. All right. Uh, do we know of a method that given a number of observations, right, number of equations um, that map x, y into z, right, and given these values, can we estimate some parameters, right? Let me call them, let me call these parameters maybe a, because I think that that's what we used before, right? Uh, or theta, let's call them theta, it doesn't matter, right? These parameters are A, as we, use, as we call them before. Do we know of a method that we can use to estimate those parameters of that function? What is that? Least squares. squares, right? So the only constraint is that these equations have to be linear, right? But if we have, say, an orthographic model or many affine linear models, then we can estimate this with linear least squares. And we're done. That's it, right? OK, um, that works pretty well, I have to say. It works relatively well. The more data that you can uh, give to, uh, to the system, the better it will work, right? Uh, now, what happens if we want to use a more complicated function to find that functional mapping between 2D and 3D? Because, you know, all not, not all the faces are alike. So you want to learn maybe some nonlinear mapping between 2D and 3D. Now, in that case, uh, you need to use an extension of least squares. So you want to use uh, the first option, right, was linear least squares. The second option would be use some nonlinear least squares. OK? Any. And we have already seen one in detail here in this course, right? And that was called uh, gradient descent or gradient ascent, right? And both the stochastic and batch methods. And that led us to defining deep networks, right? Or deep learning. And what's a deep network? A deep network is a graph Right? This nurse is generally DAG, doesn't have to be a DAG, but generally it's a directed acyclic graph um, that has some connections, right? From some input set of nodes that is X, right? Or in our case, it would be XY, right? 
and an output which we call it z, right? And the graph does this functional mapping that we're interested in, right? And now I know the x, y input and the z output that I want for a number of objects that I have collected with a video sequence and hence reconstructed in 3D, right? And I can use this as samples to, to find the parameters of that deep neural network that we have defined before, right? That map me from 2D to 3D, correct? And once I have created that model, now if I have a new image that I have never seen before, I input the x, y coordinates of one, of my landmarks in that model, and I get out the three-dimensional coordinate z, right? And therefore, I can go from a simple or single two-dimensional image to a three-dimensional model of the shape of that object. Right? See how this works? And all this with all the methods that we already know. So now you can see how we can start putting everything together, all the things that we have discussed of how to detect with low-level methods the uh, contour of an object, right? Construct the background, detect the contour, uh, define the shape in a model that is invariant to translation, a scale and rotation, and then recover the 3D shape if we're interested, right? And create object recognition systems uh, of that shape that are invariant to this translation, the scale, rotation, and even the formations of the object or the uh, gait of a person moving or behavior, as we'll see later, actions. Okay? You see how this works? Any questions? All right, awesome. So, in particular, the paper that I posted uh, in Canvas that does this, which was the first one that, um, that solved that problem this way. Now, there are a number of people that have um, done other similar methods for this, uh, but this was done by uh, one of my students um, a few years back. Um, the, the network that was defined um, uses for the, say, the health layer. Remember that I need to define the, uh, how to, to define each of the parameters of my, my graph. So A L plus one, I'm going to define, which goes to the next layer, right? It's given by a 10H function of omega L a L plus B L. And, and remember this is the linear model, the classical linear model that we have, always the same, plus some nonlinear transformation, right? And it's up to you to uh, define uh, which li or to decide which linear transformation to use. Um, so so uh, let's see. Uh, this, uh, this, oops. Uh, uh, this one. So these are the parameters. These are my weights, right? Okay, makes more sense. And remember that in gradient descent or gradient ascent, you need to minimize if you do gradient descent or maximize if you do gradient ascent some criterion, right? A, what's called a loss function or an objective function. And in our case here, what we want is to be able to reconstruct our observations as well as possible, right? So during training, what you have is the 3D coordinates of the landmark point, right? 
for that object, and the estimate of your network on that three-dimensional landmark point. And then you want to minimize this. So this is called, also remember, the reconstruction error in computer vision. So you want to minimize over all the points uh, uh, that define your shape, the zi hat minus your ai l for the lth notation, uh, for the lth uh, layer, uh, or actually it's a capital L, which I think is the, what we used before, right? Capital L for the last layer, right? Which is your zi. All right, awesome. So I think that's all that we have uh, for shape analysis. Um, so the next thing is to, um, to, to get more into the nuts and bolts of object recognition. Um, still using shape and landmarks and other types of shape uh, modelings that, that we're going to see. Um, so I want to spend some time on this. This is called also typically a huge area within computer vision called model-based vision or model-based object recognition. And the idea is that you construct a geometrical model <coughs> of your object and you use that to recognize the object in 3D space, okay? And we're going to see that there are a number of things that we can do uh, once we have created that model, right? So one of the things that we can do is if I have a, 3D, uh, a model, 2D or three-dimensional model of my object, I can see whether I can reproject that model back into the image and, and find whether there is a matching and we have already seen two algorithms that can do that, active shape models and active appearance models, right? We're gonna see more about that. Uh, but also you can do, so that would be called, by the way, top-down algorithms or approaches. And the reason for this is because you have a model at the very top and you're projecting it down onto the image, right? And we have to compare this with what's called bottom-up approaches, where you start at the image and you extract features from that, uh, from that image to try to match these features to the model that you have uh, stored in memory. Okay? So there's these two distinctions. Um, one other way to, to understand this is also by considering computer vision the inverse problem of computer graphics. What is computer graphics? Computer graphics, I have a three-dimensional model, and I want to generate an image that looks realistic, right? Computer vision is kind of the opposite. <laughs> I have an image that is realistic because it's an image, and I want to see to which of these three-dimensional models this corresponds to, right? So, uh, you will see in the literature a lot about, especially years past, uh, a lot about computer vision being the inverse problem of computer graphics. Okay. So people have spent actually years, decades, uh, understanding or working with uh, computer graphics scientists to try to understand how computer graphics works such that if I have the function f that might from 3D to 2D, can I find the function f inverse that might from 2D to 3D, right? And I solve the problem this way. And then after that, we're gonna start talking about not model-free uh, uh, algorithms because all algorithms have a model, but that model is going to be defined intrinsically by the simple images or videos that we are given rather than by us extracting low-level and then mid-level features that allow us to construct these models, okay? And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about those in the area of face recognition because this is where all these models really started and become, uh, became really popular. And this is gonna lead us to modern algorithms for object recognition, uh, which are extensions of what uh, we used to do in face recognition uh, years back, which are the ones that you have seen in the news 
uh, recently uh, all these albums I can recognize a variety of, of objects, including the ones that are in self-driving cars. Okay? By the way, I want to say one final uh, thing. Um, I just saw the, uh, this weekend that uh, PBS, you know this program Nova on PBS, they had a special program on self-driving cars uh, technology uh, last week. So you have it online, worth going to pbs.org and watching that program because uh, a lot of, they, they tell a lot of truth. I thought it was very well done. So I think it's worth uh, your time. And the idea that we're gonna have self-driving cars in the next five years, it's obviously laughable. Uh, the idea that we're gonna have uh, self-driving cars in 10 years, it's uh, who knows what's gonna happen in 10 years, but very unlikely, right? And believe me, it's not because I don't want to see self-driving cars. I wish I had a self-driving car and I have to drive. But I, you know, I've been working in this area for long enough to know these problems are very, very difficult, right? So if you have time uh, this week or, or next weekend, uh, uh, have a look. I think it's worth watching. All right, I'll see you Thursday. Oh, there's a question. Um, so all of these shape um, analysis techniques are yeah. all heavily dependent on how well you can extract landmarks? Ah, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, Yes. But the main landmark detection method you talked about was SIFT. But SIFT uh, doesn't well, necessarily guarantee that you get the same landmark points. Well, time. right. You can use RENSEC on top of that to find robustness in the detection of points, remember? So always use some robust method to make sure that the fiducial points or landmark points that you extract are good. Now, remember what I said when we started talking about shape analysis. There are three types of shape uh, landmark points that you can extract, right? Anatomical, if you can define anatomical landmarks, use those, right? But those have uh, to be hand Not necessarily. There are, there are ways to, to define algorithms that detect those. Uh, then there are the mathematical, like SIFT, right? That are good, but not as good as anatomical. And third are like pseudo landmarks, right? They just strike uh, how we want. Now, I have to say, for many years, uh, I was uh, claiming that the problem in computer vision for high level vision was not object recognition. That's not the real problem. We know how to do object recognition. I just introduced here methods how to shape analysis. And these methods are extremely good. I mean, and extremely simple to implement, right? I mean, there are a few lines of code. Uh, the albums that we're gonna see on Thursday, there are a few lines of code. They're not complicated methods, um, but, they depend on very well precise detection of these landmark points, right? So the real problem in computer vision, for model-based vision at least, is not object recognition, but land precise landmark detection. And I, I spent years <laughs> pleading with the community to focus on that problem, right? Because it's much more attractive for people to work on object recognition, but we already know how to do object recognition if we have the, the uh, good or uh, precise detection of fiducial points, right? And that's really hard. That's a very hard problem. And to this day, it's not very well solved. I think it's solvish in some domains. I think we're doing a good job. Like with faces, we're almost Perfect. I would say perfect, but we can do a very, very good job, right? And you can see this in apps like Snapchat and now Facebook and others, right? That they'll paint your face, right? You put your phone there and the face will appear painted or you'll become a cat or what have you, right? Uh, uh, Apple has this with these new emojis, memojis and things like that. Sure, you can do all that very reliably now, uh, but for faces, not for everyday objects, right? for every other everyday object. So um, this is still a completely, uh, not completely, but a partially unsolved problem. Now, the reason why these other methods that I was alluding to that are based on shading that we're gonna talk, especially on face recognition, and then we're gonna see how they extended it to object recognition. These other methods are um, not model free because the model is there, but the model is a statistical model learned from the pixels of the image instead of 
the landmarks of the shape of the object, right? And by doing that, you avoid having to solve the real problem. But let's face it, we humans can go there and specifically manually detect the landmarks. Computers can't, right? So there are still many problems in object recognition that computers cannot do because we have avoided solving that problem by going this other route uh, and letting algorithms figure out how to get something out of just data, right? All right, see you Thursday. <laughs>